McDonald with the Allianz Process de Chicago, and today I will be reading Part 2, Chapter 11 from Bonjour Tristesse by Françoise Segon. We did not meet again until dinner, both of us nervous about the togetherness that was so suddenly ours again. I was not in the least hungry, and neither was he. We both knew that it was essential for Anne to come back to us. For my part, I could not bear for long the memory of the distraught face that she had turned towards me before she left, nor the thought of her grief and my responsibility. I had forgotten all about my patient stratagems and the plans that I had so carefully laid. I felt that I had completely lost my compass, there was nothing to guide me, and I could see from my father's face that he felt the same way. Do you think she has abandoned us for long? he asked. She's no doubt heading to Paris, I replied. Paris, my father murmured pensively. Perhaps we shall never see her again. He looked at me, quite at a loss, and took my hand across the table. You must hold this against me terribly. I don't know what got into me. On the way back through the wood with Elsa, she... The fact is, I kissed her, and Anne must have arrived at that very moment, and... I wasn't listening. The idea of those two characters, my father and Elsa, embracing in the shadow of the pines, seemed to me farcical and devoid of reality. I couldn't visualize it. The only vivid thing from that day, and cruelly vivid at that, was Anne's face as I had last seen it, with grief written on it, the face of a person who has been betrayed. I took a cigarette from my father's packet and lit it. That was another thing that Anne would not tolerate, smoking during meals. I smiled at my father. I understand fully. It's not your fault. It was a moment of madness, as they say. But Anne will just have to forgive us. What I mean is, she'll have to forgive you. What's to be done? he asked. He looked dreadful. I was sorry for him and for myself as well. Why was Anne abandoning us like this? Why was she making us suffer for what amounted to nothing more than indiscretion? She was under no, was she under no obligation to us? We'll write to her, I said, and ask for her forgiveness. What a brilliant idea, my father cried, at last finding a way out of the state of remorseful inactivity in which we had been wallowing for the past three hours. Without waiting to finish our meal, we pushed back the tablecloth and what was on it. My father went to fetch a big lamp, pen and ink, and his writing paper, and we settled down opposite each other. The gracious scene thus created seemed so likely to bring about Anne's return that we were almost cheerful. A bat came and traced silken curves outside the window. My father bent his head and began to write. I cannot recall without an unendurable awareness of mockery and cruelty the letters overflowing with kind sentiments that we penned to Anne that evening, the two of us sitting in the lamplight like two diligent, clumsy schoolchildren working away in silence at the impossible task of getting Anne back. But we produced two masterpieces of their kind, full of good excuses, affection, and repentance. By the time I had finished, I was more or less persuaded that Anne would be unable to resist them and that a reconciliation was imminent. I could already envisage the scene of forgiveness, full of delicacy and humor. It would take place in our drawing room in Paris. Anne would come in and the phone rang. It was 10 o'clock. We exchanged glances, at first astonished and then full of hope. It must be Anne phoning to say that she forgave us and that she was coming back. My father leapt, leapt to the phone and shouted down in a joyful, Hello! Then a voice almost too low to be heard. He said, Yes. Yes. Where is that? Yes. It was my turn to stand up. I was becoming fearful. I watched my father as he passed his hand over his face in an automatic gesture. At length, he gently put the receiver back and turned to face me. She has had an accident, he said. It happened on the Route de Listerel. It took them some time to discover her address. They phoned Paris and were given our number here. He was speaking in a monotonous, mechanical way, and I did not dare interrupt. The accident happened at the most dangerous spot. There have been a lot of accidents at that particular spot, it seems. The car fell 50 meters. It would have been a miracle if she had escaped. I remember the rest of the night as if it had been a bad dream. The road coming up to meet our headlights, my father's face set rigidly, the door of the clinic. My father did not want me to see her. 
I sat on a bench in the waiting room staring at a framed print of Venice. My mind was a blank. A nurse told me that it was the sixth accident at that spot since the beginning of the summer. My father still did not come back. Then it struck me that, in the manner of her death, Anne had once again marked herself out as different from us. If we had committed suicide, my father or I, always assuming that we would have had the courage to do so, it would have been with a bullet in the head and we would have left a, behind an explanatory note designed to permanent, to be permanently unsettling to those responsible and, no, and to trouble their sleep. But Anne had bestowed on us a magnificent gift by making it entirely possible for us to believe in an accident, given the dangerous spot and the instability of her car. It was a gift that before long we would be weak enough to accept. And in any case, if I now refer to it as suicide, I'm taking a rather romantic view of it. Would anybody be likely to commit suicide on account of creatures like my father and myself who have need of no one, either living or dead? Be that as it may, my father and I have only ever spoken of it as an accident. We returned to the house the next day at around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Elsa and Cyril were waiting for us there, sitting on the steps. To us, they were just two drab, forgotten characters, neither of whom had really known Anne or loved her. There they were with their petty little love stories and the two things that gave them any appeal, their good looks and their discomfiture. Cyril came up to me and laid his hand on my arm. I looked at him. I had never loved him. I had found him kind and attractive. I had loved the pleasure he gave me, but I did not need him. I was going away, leaving behind me that house, that boy, and that summer. My father was with me. It was he now who took my arm as we went into the house. Inside were Anne's jacket, her flowers, her room, her scent. My father closed the shutters, took a bottle from the fridge, and fetched two glasses. It was the only remedy we could aspire to. Our letters of apology were still spread over the table. I pushed them aside and they fluttered onto the parquet. My father, coming towards me with a full glass, hesitated, then avoided stepping on them. I found all that symbolic and in poor taste. I took my glass in both hands and drained it in one gulp. The room was in semi-darkness. I could see my father silhouetted against the window. The sea was beating on the shore. That's all for now. Thank you.